So after you moved your 500 CDs from LA to San Francisco, <laughs> and you went to work at Benchmark because you wanted to find something in the music industry, you ended up buying Survey Monkey, which is not in music, which Summit and not Benchmark. What happened? Um, yeah. <laughs> so I looked at a bunch of different things, and I sort of decided I was either going to um, I think he realized that Survey Monkey wasn't music after he bought it. <laughs> um, I wanted to um, I wanted to either start my own business or run something that was already at scale, and those were the two kind of paths I was going down. And so um, I did actually help start a couple businesses while I was at Benchmark. One of them um, with my partner from Launch, which uh, we have in LA still called Dashbox, and then another business that we got my friend uh, Jim Lanzone to run called Clicker, which we sold to CBS. Um, so those were businesses I started, but neither one of those fit what I wanted to do in terms of running it. And um, the guys at Spectrum um, Equity, uh, I was on the board of one of their companies called Ancestry.com, a subscription business, and they approached me and said, hey, we're, we, we're looking at this company, SurveyMonkey, and we'd love to get your help looking at it. And so I started looking at it, and I knew the business. Um, I'd used the product uh, myself. Uh, my teams had used it at Yahoo. Um, but I hadn't really ever thought about it as a business. And no one really knew that much about the business. People used the product. And uh, started looking at it, and I was just blown away. Here was this incredible business, yet at the time, in 2008, there were 12 people, seven of whom were customer support. The business was generating $25 million in revenue and $22 million in operating profit. Um, and had never raised any capital. Um, and so it was this incredible business. It was growing 25, 30% a year. Um, and I thought, this is great. I mean, th there's such a great business, but there's so many things they hadn't done with it because it was still being operated like a startup. And I love the idea of that I could kind of build a team and sort of be not a founder, because I clearly wasn't a founder, but I could at least kind of shape the team and the business around what I wanted to do. Um, but yet I was already operating at scale. So it was kind of a really good fit for, for um, I was interested. In, and the founder was interested in selling control, which is very unusual um, in this situation. He didn't need the money. He was, he was putting half a million dollars a week in his pocket. So he, he certainly didn't need the cash. But he just knew the business could be bigger, and he didn't know how to do it. And he thought if he, if he sold control to somebody, um, that they would sort of help take it to the next level. So. Um, it worked very well. Um, we, we started working on it in the fall of 2008. We closed in April of 2009, and I joined. The, the company was based in Portland. Um, and I think it's the story of how SurveyMonkey started very different than my first company. I raised angel money and venture capital and went public and all this stuff. That, Sur that is very similar, the, the story of SurveyMonkey. It's, it's maybe more similar to a lot of the uh, companies or the entrepreneurs yeah. in the audience because accessing venture capital in emerging markets is so hard that you'll see a lot of them just bootstrapped. And, yeah. and, 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 and very often you'll see amazing companies that have never raised venture capital. Yeah, and I think, you know, um, SurveyMonkey is the ultimate lean startup, if you will. Like, the fact that he didn't have any capital actually allowed him to make some decisions that proved to be what made the company successful. So rather than the lack of capital, I think people often think of the lack of capital is the problem in the business. At least in this particular business, it was actually the reason it, the company was successful versus a whole host of other competitors. So the, um, Ryan Finley, who's the founder of SurveyMonkey, was a year out of college in the University of Wisconsin, Madison, which is in the middle of the country. Um, uh, cold. I'm from Minnesota, so I can kind of say that. Um, and. Uh, he was working in a little software company. Someone asked him to do um, a survey of their new software product. That they, you know, this was shrink-wrapped software sold in retail. And he did. He looked around and saw, hey, I should just, he was a developer, I should just write my own survey tool. So he wrote his own. Then people said, oh, this is great. We could use this for lots of things. And it was 1999, and you should start a company. And so he quit his job at the age of 23 and started his company. And that part in 1999 was not unusual. but. What he didn't know anybody who'd ever started a company. He didn't know how to go raise money, so he just had to just kind of figure it out. And he came up with this funny name, which makes people laugh, uh, but it makes people remember it. <laughs> and that was really important. He didn't have any money to do marketing. But it turns out that the survey itself 
So people come on our site, they create surveys, they send them out. You guys took some surveys, I think, today to sort of uh, uh, to uh, figure out what topics you wanted to cover. Um, and the process of taking a survey that someone else has sent you, and it's always sent to you by someone you have some relationship with. Uh, uh, you know, you're a customer, you're um, an employee, you're a parent at a school, you're at an event like this. So it's always someone you have some relationship with, it's not random. And those people take the survey and they learn about SurveyMonkey from the taking of the survey. And, um, and then some of those people come back eventually and create their own surveys. Um, so that viral loop was sort of critical, but he had no choice. You had almost no customer acquisition budget and you were growing There was, like there was no marketing ever. The only marketing Ryan told me he ever did was he dressed up in a gorilla suit one time and jumped around with a sign behind a TV camera at, at the CES show. Sounds uh, like some guys I know here. <laughs> <laughs> gorilla marketing at its finest. Um, but you know, the, the fact that he never raised capital and that then even the, the way you're running it today, which you have raised a lot of capital, but you, um, in fact, you just raised a billion dollars, which if that had been an IPO, it would have been one of the largest tech IPOs of the year. And, but, but you're actually raising part equity, part debt, you're actually, part of that is to buy some of the early investors. And I ask you this because from the perspective of many entrepreneurs in the audience, it could be a different model that the one we, the, the, the one is presented almost as the only alternative, right? Everybody's reading the, the tech blogs and you think that the only alternative is you have to raise a, a seed, then a series A, then a series B, then eventually somehow take the company public or sell it to be able to pay back those investors. That's really, really hard to do in a lot of these emerging markets. Some of these companies have some of these characteristics that are incredibly good businesses that produce a lot of cash and perhaps there is a different model like the one you're following, you're not following a traditional model, you're not aspiring to take this company public, or at least not, not right now, and there is a model in which you can run the, the, the ownership, the capital structure, and, and the long-term uh, vision of the company in a way that it doesn't need to be sold or taken public. Yeah, I think we've sort of said, look, there's a lot of cost to being public, and if you can avoid those costs, and you're not gonna get the benefits, and if you don't need cash, and you don't need a currency to do acquisitions, it's not gonna help you sell more product, and if it's just liquidity, there's ways to find liquidity. Um, but I think what really drives the, the, the ability to do that is building a profitable business. And I think oftentimes, kind of the traditional model, you said, is not necessarily around building a profitable business, it's about growth. Yep. It's about how do we grow as quickly as possible. Well, it turns out like this business they never had any capital. The business grew organically through a freemium model. Most of our customers don't pay us, a small percentage do, but we don't have any marketing costs and those sort of things. And the business built slowly but profitably. So the business is 13 years old today. And we did 113 million in revenue last year um, and 62 million in, in operating profit. Um, but, but it took a long time for it to get to that scale. And I think one of the things that happens in the traditional model is people try to get scale faster um, because that's how you get the next round, that's how you get the next valuation. People are overly focused on growth. And so if you're gonna think about this alternative method, it's like, how do you get profitable growth? And it and, and doesn't always work in all markets. Sometimes you're in a race, um, you know, I'm an investor in uh, Peche Urbano, uh, as is Wences in, in Brazil, and, um, you know, that was very much a fast and furious race against all the competitors in that market, including Groupon and all sorts of things. And so sometimes you don't have the luxury of profitable growth. But finding businesses where you can grow profitably gives you a lot more control as an entrepreneur. You can raise money, you don't have to. Um, you can go public, you don't have to. It, so I think, um, like I said, it's not always an option, but if you have a business where you have profitability and someone says, let me give you some money so you can grow faster and you'll lose a lot of money yeah. in the short term, but it'll make it up in the end. Sometimes that's the right decision, and sometimes it's not. Yeah. And so yeah. just because somebody wants to give you money doesn't mean you should take it. Yeah. Or sometimes the fact that some people didn't give you money may be a blessing, even yeah. though it, it, it's not nice to, it's not how you feel at the time. But. Yeah, I mean, the one other thing I would say is about the business when he started, the other thing is he, um, he focused on making the product as easy as possible to use. And that relentless focus was really what is the driving success of SurveyMonkey. The product is easier to use than any other online survey tool, and that's why it won, and then the viral loop kind of 
created this network effect. But he did that because he believed in it, but also because he had no choice, because it was basically just him and his brother answering all the support emails. So every time he added new features, he got flooded with support emails. So his, he, you know, it was sort of this you know, kind of constantly learning thing. It's like, well, I, I want to make this easier, not add lots of features that make it more complex. And so that feedback loop was pretty important. 